So the first part of the uh, first hour is supposed to cover the most recent interesting aspects of AI technology. And I'd like to tell you about my passion, which is, um, which is now reaching a point where I think it can have a profound impact, what, what I call voice computing. And voice computing is when you can no longer use keyboards, can no longer use touch, the only thing you have is voice. Just like when you are interacting with other people, like your postdocs and your assistants, that's all you have. And in which case, how, do, how does that proceed and what can happen? And it turns out we now have all the relevant technologies, and I'd like to go through that. And if we do, do the, create such a voice computing, it can have profound impact on the society as a whole. So let me take you through it. So the bottom of the pyramid represents about 3 billion people who have less than $2.5 of income every day. Uh, and these are what I call semi-literate. Many of them are illiterate. They can't read any language. That's part of the so-called literacy divide. And there are others who can read, but they really cannot understand, comprehend. And um, so I call both of these groups together semi-literate. Uh, if you're a semi-literate person on this planet, the only way you can use the computers is to speak to them. You can't read what is on the screen. You can't you know, understand, you can't follow. But, but on the other hand, these three billion people lead perfectly normal lives. You know, and so the question is, uh, sh should they be deprived of our technology? If they're not, if not, how can they use it? And the only way they can use it is through voice computing, it turns out. And by voice computing, uh, imagine for your, in your lab, you're a, you know, you're a professor, and you have a postdoc, and you have a secretary. You just tell them what to do, and they go do it. If they can't do it, they come back and say, I'm sorry, I can't do it. Did you mean this or not? They have a clarification dialogue. And I imagine computing and computer intelligent agents being exactly like that. You don't tell them all sorts of unnecessary information, and the question is, are we there? The question is, what, what do we have and what do we need to do to get there? So, <clears throat> voice computing, where there's no keyboard or touch, can help these semi-literate people in all kinds of ways that you may not have thought about, they can help you to read newspapers. They can help you to read foreign language movies, listen to Khan Academy lectures, vote online, and do shopping online. And, uh, and the interesting aspect of the, all of these is to have uh, a speech recognition, translation, and synthesis technologies, speech to speech, and uh, having apps that can enable different aspects of it. So for example, a mobile app for entertainment and education, it would have to be able to understand speech. And, and for example, YouTube, you can actually get transcriptions of what is being said. Then you have to translate it and then do the speech synthesis all in real time. You, so you, basically, you've heard about dubbing in movies. Automatic, dynamic, real-time dubbing is possible today. Uh, in fact, uh, in 19, 2012, Rick Rashid gave a talk in English in, uh, in, in China, and it got translated into Chinese and synthesized into Chinese all in real time. The, and that particular case, uh, it was kind of a, uh, domain that was understood and they've tried it and it, it was, but I, I, it's not yet ready for prime time. It should be, and I don't know why not, and, uh, but it, I think it will be there soon enough. And the same thing, if you have such technology, if I can't read a newspaper, I can say, I want to read this newspaper in my local language. I see some pictures. I can't read this uh, screen, 
I can't touch on it and say, but I can touch and say, there's a nice picture. What is this headline about? It will read the headline. And now you can go and say, can you now read me the rest of the story? I'll say, go to the next. So the whole issue of designing an app, an, a, a, a newspaper reading app, that will read to illiterate people. So suddenly, they all can not only, one of the interesting side effects of it is they will learn to sight read. They will see, see the words, and if you do the proper interface, it highlights the words as you're reading. Then you essentially learn to read without having to be taught how to read in some sense. So uh, I, one of the areas I work in is digital democracy. I believe we are entering a phase where almost all countries in the next 50 years will be voting online. And different countries have different constitutional requirements, so that may or may not happen soon. But authentication, authorization, and audit technologies, we understand fully well, and it will be done. And the same is true with respect to online shopping. Essentially, it empowers a rural, illiterate person to get the same benefits of market economies that the, the rich economies now benefit from, from Amazon and so on, you're getting the best product at the lowest possible price. And Amazon is getting to one day and four, four hour delivery times. And I believe they will solve that same problem in rural India and rural Africa so that you'll be able to do the same thing. And learning without a teacher is perhaps the most interesting app that happens with this because we're getting more and more online content. And if I can have a Socratic dialogue with an agent, which knows a lot more than I do, and which would explain to me when I don't understand, otherwise I'm reading. So the whole idea of learning without a teacher, because there are not enough good teachers, especially in the third world countries, the two you know, kind of give you the opportunity. So, given if all of these things are real, I, I claim they're not only real, they're near term, then the illiterate populations will be the biggest source of customers for speech-based apps in the future. And I estimate that to be a trillion dollars a year. How did I get that number? Three billion times a dollar a day, which is the disposable income, is uh, essentially $3 billion a day times 365 days is where you get the trillion dollars from, okay? So yeah, there is not to be sneezed at. So the question is what technology exists? Speech to speech, speech in, translate, speech out into another language already exists in, in Microsoft, Facebook, Google, uh, I haven't seen the Google version yet, but they have the best language translation capability of anybody, but uh, I'm, I'm sure all of them have it at this point. Uh, but, but the unfortunate thing is most of them mistakenly think the biggest market are the commercial languages like French, German, English, Japanese, and Chinese. But there, most people are literate. They don't need the technology. That I, I have a, a translate app on my, my iPhone, I never use it because I, I don't. But if you can't read or, or, or write, then you would use it every day. If you use it every day, that is the killer app. If three billion people are using it, you can't think of any better killer app than that, right? So there is a, a mistaken understanding of the market opportunities, but I think it'll be, fix itself. So the apps tailored to semi-literate populations of the kind that I told you uh, will have a profound impact, but the user interface is very important. It has to be one minute learning time, one click, not three clicks to do something. And, uh, you know, I said two clicks here. Sometimes you have to say, what do you want to do and, and then do it. So you, you may need to, and it's all spoken dialogue. There's no keyboard. There is no touch, no, you know, everything has to be speech only. Imagine your assistant or imagine your postdoc and that's what you'll be doing here. If you can tell your postdoc to do something and uh, then this app should do exactly the kind, the same, behave the same way. And all these apps will require speech recognition, spoken dialogue, speech to speech translation 
and uh, all of those technologies exist already. Question answering dialogue already exists. So if I take a, uh, you know, I don't know how many of you have used uh, Amazon Echo Alexa agent. Uh, I created another agent called Asha. It turns out in order for systems to great, you know, quickly recognize, it has to be a two syllable name. There should be a fricative in, in between. With, in, with that, it's easier to reliably recognize. So Asha is a common name in many, many uh, cultures. So you can do, say, Asha, pay me Shakespeare, Hamlet, and it'll play to you in local language. You can say, Asha, read me the Inadu newspaper. It'll do that. Or you can say, Asha, order me eggs and bread and whatever. It'll get delivered to you, say, you know, the same day or next day. And Asha, you know, I want to talk to my grandson in Seattle, and it'll do that. And Asha charge my mobile device with a thousand rupees or whatever. And again, all these things are routine, and they are already being done. You know, if you take Siri or Cortana, uh, Alexa, they're all doing it. And so the question is, why can't we do it for the orphan languages? What we need are orphan you know, languages, there are many languages that are uh, not considered commercially viable. Therefore, you know, it turns out to build a translation app into Marathi, you need to understand Marathi. You need to have a database. All of that requires a certain amount of investment. The tools exist, the technology exists, they just haven't been done for these languages. And uh, when I talk to them, Everybody agrees it's a good idea, but nobody wants to step up to the plate, right? So anyway, there's a whole set of architecture issues I won't go into here, but it has to be non-intrusive, autonomic. That is, if you have an app on, a, on your uh, iPhone, you have to tap it. This has to be always on and always working and always learning. And, and if it's always on, it will run out of battery very quickly. Therefore, you need either a desktop one like Amazon Echo or some other new technology we haven't invented yet. And uh, it, it monitors, analyzes, and learns from experience. And it shares data suitably anonymized uh, so that it's learning preferences uh, by observing other similar people's choice through social networks, learning task similarity and user similarity, learning by error correction, and simply learning by, through clarification dialogue. So none of these are what you, we now call deep learning, which we'll talk about, but deep learning is an essential part of the cis technology that has been invented for speech. So uh, I think what we'll see is the, the implications of all of these. So no single company seems to want to make investments in these uh, orphan languages but there are many languages that more than 20 million people speak. So the market size is reasonably big. So we ought to be able to look at these languages. And so for every, for every illiterate population, it will become a lifeline and used every, used every day. That's what is the definition of a killer app. If you touch it every day, then you have an app that makes sense. I have a lot of apps on my iPhone I have not touched even once in, every, in a year. So then it doesn't matter. In conclusion, two billion semi-literate population, two billion plus uh, in the world are a major untapped market and AI technology, especially effective use of speech technology and voice computing is the only option, only option to support their needs. And we have all the needed tools and technology and if there is an issue of orphan languages, costs associated with it, local governments will probably be willing to support. And here is one area where Amazon, Google, Microsoft should all kind of collaborate, share the data. There's no, nothing magical. They'll all collect the same stupid data, and right now they're all kind of proprietary. We should not keep them so proprietary. We should kind of share it. So with that, thank you.